Hi, my name is Jeffrey Smith, and I research the dangers of genetically engineered foods. And one of the aspects of genetically engineered foods is that they are Roundup ready. Most of the GMOs, genetically modified organisms, are Roundup ready, meaning they're designed to be sprayed with Roundup herbicide. So when we look at the dangers of GMOs, we look at the dangers of Roundup because the plants drink the Roundup and deposit a portion of it in the food which we eat and have a gift for us. And we're here with Stephanie Seneff, who's going to tell us about some of the gifts that Roundup gives us, in particular, its active ingredient called glyphosate. Now, Roundup was originally patented as an herbicide by the company called Monsanto, and they own most of the patents for GMOs as well. And having studied Monsanto for a number of years, I can say that in their quieter, more reflective moments, they asked themselves, what would Darth Vader do? Because what they've come up with is a way of pretending that they're beneficial and then insinuating themselves into the food industry, the agriculture industry, and now it turns out that what they have is very, very dangerous. And among those very dangerous things is glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup. And it was the subject of a very comprehensive evaluation, an article co-written by Dr. Seneff, and it's called Glyphna. This is going to be more science than you're ready for the name here. Mm. Glyphosate suppression of cytochrome P450 enzymes and amino acid biosynthesis by the gut microbiome pathways to modern disease. Now, I looked at this, at this paper and it all reads like that. Very, very difficult to understand. But what jumped out at me in the abstract, I'm going to read it to you. The consequences of glyphosate and all the things that it can go wrong are most of the diseases and conditions associated with a Western diet, which include gastrointestinal problems, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, depression, autism, infertility, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. We're also going to talk about anorexia and aggression and other things. So, uh, Dr. Seneff, tell me, what is the central thesis of how this Darth Vader chemical can cause so many problems in our health? Um, I think the key thing is that it causes both nutritional deficiencies and toxins in your, in your system. And it does both of these in, in, in part, maybe in large part, through the gut bacteria. Monsanto has always claimed that glyphosate is quite harmless to humans, like aspirin, and we shouldn't worry about it at all. And, and the reason is because it interferes with the shikimate pathway, which doesn't exist in our genes. So our cells, they don't have shikimate, no problem. So in other words, the way that it functions by killing plants, there's a specific, you call the shikimate pathway. So pathway is not a path you walk on, it's a metabolic pathway. It means this causes this, causes this, causes this. But there's a roadblock at the, at the beginning by glyphosate that says you can't do any of that. And that's what disrupts plants, etc. And that's what kills them. That's what kills them. Yes. So the, the idea then is that because humans don't have that metabolic pathway, then glyphosate can't get in the way of it. Right. So it's harmless. Right. So it's harmless. This yeah. was the basic premise. Right. Now, here's a huge flaw with that premise. We have out gut bacteria. Our bacteria outnumber our own cells 10 to 1. For every cell we have, we have 10 bacteria, microbes of various sorts, and all of them. Are, have the shikimate pathway. So they're going to respond to glyphosate with extreme disruption of their, of their livelihood. And in particular, glyphosate disrupts preferentially the beneficial bacteria. And so it allows the pathogens to overgrow. And then once you've got the pathogens, you've got all the toxins that they produce, and then you get uh, inflammation, which wrecks the gut lining, you get leaky gut, and then these toxins get out into the bloodstream, they can go to the brain. I mean, your, your body is then responding to a very serious crisis at that point. So here, I mean, I've been to a lot of medical conferences and they're constantly talking about gut bacteria and leaky gut and gastrointestinal disorders as the basis of inflammation, autoimmune disease, a whole host of that's the right. Western. So you're basically, if that's the key for a lot of medical practitioners and glyphosate is sort of like the initiator of all that stuff, Right. It's really like a missing link. Why don't you talk about, we're going to go through each of the diseases that are listed and some that haven't, we haven't yet talked about and show how glyphosate is linked to it. When I say glyphosate, by the way, you can think Roundup. You can think of the same herbicides that you spray on your lawn right. and let your kids play on and You're your right. dogs roll on and you hug your dogs and you lick your hands. And I, I just remember glyphosate Roundup, okay? 
So tell me, how did you get into this topic? Yeah, very interesting. Um, I've been extremely concerned about autism for quite some time, actually for 30 years. I had a best friend 30 years ago whose son uh, was diagnosed with autism, and I saw firsthand what that's like. And I've watched the rate of autism skyrocket in the last Five years, it's extremely scary. One in 150, one in 100, one in 88, and the most recent numbers in March of 2013, one in 50. In a telephone poll, one in 50 families, you know, parents are admitting autism. This is the rate of the, in, the, in the new generation. You do the math, five years, one in 50 today. 20 years from now, every other boy in this country will be diagnosed on the autism spectrum. I think that is a really scary idea. So I decided, several years ago, I needed to look at autism. I just needed to try to understand. And it's clear that the, you, most of the research is involved in genetics. And they're finding this gene, that gene, this other gene, all tiny, tiny contributions. And for some reason that I do not understand, the research into the environmental factors is practically nil. And uh, it has to be an environmental issue. With the, kind of, with the rate at which it's growing, it has to be environmental. Now, one of the things that's really increased in our environment in the last five years is glyphosate. And this is because of the GMO crops, directly your, your thing. The, and they claimed that with GMOs, glyphosate usage would go down, and in fact, it has clearly gone up. And we have the numbers in our paper that show uh, you know, a, a two-fold increase in the use of glyphosate over a five-year period in the 2000s. So it's, because the GMOs are uh, causing the... the um, the uh, weeds to be resistant to glyphosate, they're having to use more and more. So let me explain that. So you spray the herbicide over the field, and at some point the weeds outsmart Monsanto, and they say, nah, nah, you, don't, you can't get me. So the farmers then put more glyphosate and more glyphosate, or Roundup, and the overall increase in herbicides as a result of these herbicide-tolerant crops is about 527 million pounds over the first 16 years. So glyphosate, I mean, this is not an abstract thing. It's found in the Midwest where they spray it a lot in 60 to 100% of the air samples, the rain samples, the surface water samples. It's found in the blood of pregnant women, in the unborn fetuses. It's found in the blood, in the, in the urine of city dwellers in Germany. It's basically omnipresent. It's sort of Monsanto's uh, omnipresence. So, yes. so it's everywhere. It's in us, and it operates in very, very small quantities. But I'm jumping ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, and that's right. And in fact, the U.S. consumes 25% uh, of the glyphosate that's sold. So we are huge. We are the biggest uh, use users of glyphosate in this country. So you can expect that we would have, if it's correlated with autism, we do have, in fact, high autism rates as well, and that fits. Um, so I had come to a point by last September at which I had identified two key problems with autism that were not in the brain, but they were clear associated problems. One was the gut dysbiosis. It's very clear that autistic kids often have lots of issues with their digestive system. Dysbiosis, what does that mean? Uh, the gut bacteria are not properly balanced, and there's like inflammation, and there's leaky gut. And Technical term, messed yeah, up. Okay, yeah, right. and they have trouble eating lots of different things. They right. end up with uh, gluten intolerance. Lots of the autistic kids are on gluten-free diet. You know, you can see they've got problems in the gut. Uh, number one. And number two is sulfur. There's a... Uh, sulfur. Yeah. There's a clear uh, problem with sulfur metabolites. Now, it turns out sulfur is incredibly important to the body, and there's very little t talked about it. Actually, even in nutrition books, it's hardly mentioned. It doesn't have a minimum daily requirement. There, it's considered to be plentiful, and therefore we should never worry about a deficiency. And I believe this is a key problem in our nutritional space, that we have become blind to sulfur. And I think that, in fact, sulfur deficiency, and more specifically sulfate deficiency, and I'll get to that in a moment, uh, is a key factor in all the modern problems that we're having. And it's something that is not on anybody's radar screen. So first of all, the gut bacteria is involved with both the immune system and the digestive system. So when it's messed up, it can create a whole, bit, a whole series of problems. That was off sulfate transport or trans, is that what transport sulfate? and synthesis. And both. synthesis of sulfur was sulfate. off a sulfate in the autistic kids. Mm -hmm. that was, they were showing up in literature? They have, so like they, a, have, they have like one third of the normal level of sulfate in their blood, for example. And no one has put it together as to why that's the way Yeah, that's no, it's just there's people who've written, I mean, in fact, I have a lovely quote in the paper from Rosemary Waring, who wrote, who's written extensively on this, so she must be very frustrated because she's been saying this since, my, the paper was from like the early 1990s, and, very, and I quote it from her, it's very, she says, there's got to be something wrong with sulfate and sulfur metabolism in these kids, you know, because she, that's what she was seeing. And all the sulfur metabolites, things like cysteine, homocysteine, 
um, uh, methionine, which is really, really important, and, um, and then uh, glutathione, all these things are sulfur-based, uh, very, very important sulfur-based molecules in biology that are derailed, that are I improper balance in autism. So all of this was laid out there. You found, you, I understand, you figured out why the brains of the autistic kids were functioning differently. Yes. You figured out that the gut bacteria was involved, that yes. the sulfur was involved, That's but right. the missing link was why are they having impairment yes. of the sulfur and the gut bacteria? That's exactly right. And then glyphosate came in and said, Bing. It answered. It answered all the questions. All right. And that was when I thought it's got to be the glyphosate, you know? And I really do strongly believe that at so this point. So let's start then. We have a lot of diseases to cover, and there's people suffering from a lot of diseases saying, talk about my disease. No, just a moment. We're going to start mm -hmm. with autism because that's where you started. Okay, describe to me what it is more specifically that glyphosate does mm -hmm. inside our bodies that might predispose uh, someone to have autism, or in the mother's body, if that's part of the issue. It is part of the issue, yes. Uh, both the mother and the child, and the fetus during development. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, where do I start? Because it's, of course, a complicated story. There's these two things, uh, the gut bacteria. So the gut bacteria have the shikimate pathway. The shikimate pathway produces aromatic amino acids, and these are essential amino acids. We actually get them from our diet or from our gut bacteria. So there's a bunch of amino acids that we have to get from outside. They're called essential now, is aromatic a subset of those? Yes. All right. And, and it, we can't make them. Our, right. our chemistry doesn't allow us to make them. So if we don't get them from our diet, we're basically... Aromatic like aroma. Yeah, that's like aroma, but I don't know why they're called that. They, have, um, they do have circular um, carbon chains, which is, in, which is interesting. Okay, that's important, yeah, actually. All right, all right. They have all right that. I was going to say... And that's what makes them called aromatic. All right, okay. And these circular chains are actually will come up later. Because okay. what happens then is that... Uh, the gut bacteria hitting, being hit with glyphosate, they can't make these amino acids because of this chicken mate pathway getting disrupted. And instead, they make other stuff because the pathway gets deflected into these other things. Mm -hmm. And the other things that they make are not good. There's, for example, P. cresol, which is made by C. difficile. C. difficile is a runaway pathogen that's been causing lots and lots of trouble in hospitals lately. Oh, yeah, I heard Clostridium about yeah. difficile. Yeah. And it produces this thing called P. cresol, which, which is a toxic phenol. And so there's a lot of talk about toxic phenols being produced by the gut bacteria, and those things are, to are toxic. They can disrupt your DNA. They can cause problems with your fats in your, in your cell membranes. I mean, they basically are kind of a wrecking ball. So we have a wrecking balls being produced in our own gut bacteria right. because the shikimate pathway is no longer being able to function, so it's producing... It's going these, to there instead. It's, it's saying, like a okay, bypass. we're going to produce these really horrible things. Right. Um, so and, that's one of them, okay. yeah. All right. And then, um, and then there's a certain bacteria that can break down glyphosate, which is terrific. They can get rid of it. They're really super deal. However, what they make is ammonia. Um, oh, great! And, higher uh, than the general population. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it much higher? Uh, yes. Well, I think so. And, and also in Alzheimer's. So both of them have. Um, oh, so Alzheimer's ammonia. and autistic kids have high levels of ammonia in the blood. Yeah. And uh, we know that ammonia causes what is it in the brain? Encephal. Encephalopathy, yeah. Encephalopathy. Encephalitis. Encephalop yes, it, it actually right. causes a, a very interesting, which I've written a paper about this actually, a very interesting reaction in the, in the brain um, that, um, you know, can include, in, an, in a, uh, a severe case, you can have like a high fever, you can, get, you can get seizures, you can get coma. But I think in the case of autism, there's a low-grade version of this problem going on chronically. Okay, so the, the troops that get dispatched by the, some genius inside was maybe a problem because now when they get dispatched, they create ammonia, mm -hmm. ammonia gets in the blood. Does it get in the blood automatically or does it require a leaking Ammonia gas? Is, is, a, is a gas, and, but there's, so it's, you know, it travels very easily. Oh, okay. That's part so of the gets, problem. It doesn't need a leaky gut, it just goes through. And, and, the gut, and there's a huge gut-brain connection. You know, the gut and the brain are really in very good communication with mm -hmm. each other. And in fact, I think the gut bacteria are sort of our window on the world. And they're kind of helping us out. They're looking, they're seeing the food that comes in and all the toxins that come in. They're processing it and then they're sending out signals. And this is something that's becoming a very interesting topic of research lately. A lot of people are starting to look into this space. Of the, uh, of the role of the gut bacteria in influencing how our cells behave, because they send out signals that we respond to, and particularly in the brain. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting how that happens. And the brain will sort of change its modus operandi on the basis of the information it's getting from the gut bacteria. So if we're messing up the gut bacteria, we're messing up the brain That's right. directly through electrical impulses and information exchange, but now also through gas exchange yes. and chemical exchange, which That's gets right. in the blood through ammonia, and that can cause encephalopathy 
in the brain, which can restructure the way the brain functions, causing disabilities. Am I on, am I tracking? It's terrific. Okay, so terrific. so now tell me about formaldehyde because you just said two things at once. I mean, I know that if you look at a bottle of ammonia, it doesn't say use as a gargle and mouthwash. <laughs> Same thing with formaldehyde. It's like keep away. You know, they, it's like tiny amounts of formaldehyde in FEMA vans caused all sorts of uproar and people getting sick. So yeah. formaldehyde is extremely toxic, am I right? Yes, So yes. And now we have a, a formaldehyde factory inside of us? Yes. So, <laughs> so And as you, as you well, they're, sh they're finding formaldehyde in the corn, too. I know. I saw 200 parts per million in one, one yeah, small study. Yeah, which is really high. Study, but I mean, it's very high. I want to try and get more research going, but and that's in Roundup-ready corn, folks, the corn it, that we eat, formaldehyde, at, at levels that are 100, no, 100, 200 times more than considered dangerous. So... We're having formaldehyde. What would that do in our body? That'll wreck the DNA. We need so, DNA. Yeah. <laughs> it can, it can cause, I hate when that happens. It can cause cancer, for example. So, uh, so cancer. So formaldehyde is yeah. linked to cancer. Yeah. All right. So getting back, sticking with autism for a minute, have we covered, you talked about the disabling of the sulfur, the sulfate transport and the sulfur synthesis. You talked about creating encephalopathy in the brain. We talked about the, the gut issue, and that's causing informational changes in the way that the brain develops. Is that it? Is that is that all that we have now? By the way, which is quite a bit. Is, is that is that the link? So we can stop talking about about um, autism, or is there any more related to autism? Well, these things are all related to all of the diseases. So all they're of the all they're okay. all sort of the same story. And I haven't mentioned yet the cytochrome P450 enzymes. I think right. which, is that related um, to autism also? Yes, I mean, that's directly related to sulfur problems. For all right. example, so we talked about the fact that glyphosate knocks off the shikimic pathway. And now what else are you going to tell me? Yeah, so it, so it does this by disrupting that pathway, and then it also interferes with these CYP enzymes through a totally different mechanism. It gets uh. into the cells, and in, picture, in the liver, the liver has tons of these enzymes. One of the things these enzymes do is detoxify toxins. So it disrupts the enzymes that detoxify the other toxins that we're exposed to, which is really a bad, that's meta, you know? That is. So, so in other words, there's this whole troop of, people, of, of enzymes that go around and say, okay, clear it out, you've had this... You've had stuff with this disease, or the, I mean, this chemical or that chemical. You have these overgrowth of bacteria, so it all goes into the deep primary detoxifier, the liver. Yes. And then the whole troops that are out there cleaning up, they become disabled. 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 How bad? I mean, uh, this cytochrome. Cytochrome P450. P4 you can call it CYP. 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 Yeah. So CYP is really important to make these troops do the detoxification. That's right. And so. <clears throat> How does it, so, so you're saying that glyphosate not only blocks the shikimic pathway, but another pathway altogether. Yeah, it interferes actually with the actual molecule, um, all the different molecules that are CYP enzymes, and these enzymes are really interesting. They, they have huge roles in the body. Um, they, for example, they, they, relate, they activate vitamin, vitamin D. Mm -hmm. They uh, have a lot to do with cholesterol homeostasis. And so I think that a lot of the problems people are having with cholesterol could date back, to, could, could be tied to this. And um, making the bile acids that will digest the fats. The, um, so lots if it doesn't of digest the fats, is that obesity? Yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's certainly part of that problem, okay, yeah. Right. And, um, and then uh, all, lots, the sex hormones, all, the stuff that's involved with the sex hormones. Uh, aromatase is an enzyme that converts um, testosterone into estrogen. And uh, one of the things that's associated with autism is aromatase deficiency. And uh, glyphosate has been shown specifically to block aromatase. I mean, so that's a specific example. Some of the other ones I'm generalizing from the evidence because there's several papers that talk about glyphosate disrupting various enzymes, and so you can infer that it would, and the mechanism that it uses is general to all of them. Okay. So you can infer, infer that wherever it gets close to one of them, it's going to cause problems. And there's tons of them in the liver, and the glyphosate goes straight to the liver through the hepatic port of vein. So you kind of put two and two together and get five of that. All right, so what I'm, what I'm hearing is we just opened up an entire can of worms with the CYP. Or is it yes. CYP? CYP. Yeah, CYP. you can call it however you like. <laughs> so the CYP, see, what I was told is, you know, glyphosate, everyone knows it blocks the shikimic pathway. But I was told a while ago that it also blocks this cytochrome P450, the CYP, and that that may be even worse. Yes. I think and, it is. And no one is paying maybe. attention. Maybe. I'm not even sure which one's worse. Yeah, but like, <laughs> how, do you, yes. how do you want to die? <laughs> um, so talk to me. I mean, so this can affect... Obesity, detoxification, autism, you mentioned some others. In, uh, reproduction. Reproductive Infertility. Disorders. Okay, infertility. And cholesterol homeostasis and vitamin D. Now, so vitamin D Vit deficiency has suddenly appeared on the horizon. They're like, oh, my God, half the country has vitamin D. You know, this is a real epidemic going on right now. 
with vitamin D deficiency. And you have to wonder whether that's also coinciding with this increased exposure. Because it's not just that more glyphosate is being used, it's that more of it's being soaked up because we have all these GMOs that, that are happy to just soak it up and they don't die. So now they're spraying it on the field instead of, they used to have to sort of spray it first and then they had to actually deal with the weeds because they couldn't put the glyphosate on the plant, it would die. Now they don't. So now the plant just soaks it up and then we don't even know how much is in our food because... And, and every time Monsanto <laughs> approves a new uh, Roundup Ready crop, they, they get the government to change the allowable residues. I know, that's so, right. So, you know, it had to go up like 5,000 fold in sugar beets when they had Roundup Ready sugar beets. And so there may be glyphosate in the sugar, but there's certainly glyphosate in the sugar beet pulp, which is used in animal feed, which we'll get to later. All right, so... Um, I, I want to finish up autism and then get on to these other diseases, but I think we already started to get on to these other diseases. I know, but they're all tied. I mean, it's really kind of the same story over and over, so right. <laughs> you'll see. So pick a disease. I mean, are we done with... Let me we... just do one more thing, okay, which is another effect that glyphosate has. So I think there's really at least three principal effects right. that it has. And the third one may be as important or more important than the other two. I don't know. And this is a depletion of micronutrients. And um, it, it, it basically uh, chelates... Uh, plus two, these are called plus two cations that are, um, you know, really important minerals in our body. Calcium, magnesium, zinc, iron, uh, cobalt. Zinc and, uh, and uh, sulfur deficiency are associated with autism. And so, um, so that connects up as well, the zinc deficiency having to do with the glyphosate. Let's see if we can figure out what the brain is doing Alzheimer's, yeah, yeah let me yeah. try to do a little bit about Alzheimer's. So I said cholesterol and sulfate deficiency, right. and uh, both of them are really important. Cholesterol in the membranes of the cells uh, protects the cells from ion leaks, and, um, and if you don't have enough cholesterol, then the ions start leaking across the membrane, and you have to use up all your energy pumping the ions to the other side, so the cells become energy deprived. Um, the sulfate uh, is important. Both the cholesterol is also very, very important in synaptic transport. It, it plays a critical role in the actual message that goes across from one cell to the other. And um, so uh, Alzheimer's is associated with a, uh, a, a low ratio of something called sulfatide to ceramide. And sulfatide is the thing that contains the sulfate, and the ceramide does not. So that's an indicated, indicator that they're lacking in the sulfate. And, um, and I mentioned these heparin sulfate proteoglycans that um, the deficiency in the mice that causes them to have aut autism. Right. And um, so the... Uh, so the, the, uh, the, the cells in the brain become energy deficient and then they start getting in really big trouble and they start dying. So the, the, um, it's, a really, it's a metabolism problem. There's also a glucose um, deficiency. There's a type 3 diabetes that's the brain unable to utilize glucose. And I think that that also ties directly to the sulfate because the sulfate provides an opportunity to store the glucose outside the cell in these extracellular matrix proteins. Otherwise, you can't do that because it's not safe. The glucose is very toxic, actually. Glucose causes glycation damage to anything that comes in its way. So if way. you can't store the glucose outside the cell, glucose is part of the sugar for yes. the energy. The energy. And you so you're burning your energy, and you don't have enough fuel yeah, to so, use. So because of the ions are getting away, and they're saying, you know, send in the troops, grab the ions, and they go around, they use all their energy to do that, so they're exhausted. Yeah. They say, okay, give us more energy because of the glucose. We can't store that either. Yeah. And then they try and get the signaling going, but the signaling is impaired because of the lack of sulfur. The, uh, cl cholesterol. Uh, yeah. cholesterol. Oh, and also sulfur, I suspect, but okay, I haven't got that okay, one quite so figured out yet. Right. But cholesterol is what with the signal transport. And cholesterol is also what keeps the, um, the, the membrane tight so the ions don't leak. All right. And then also cholesterol is involved in the lipid rafts where the glucose comes in. So when you don't have enough cholesterol, you have a deficiency in the number of lipid, lipid rafts, which reduces your ability to get the glucose in, which is um, probably tied directly to the sulfate because you can't store the glucose. So you sort of... Have, tired, to, have to cut it back. Tired brain cells, unable to communicate with each other. I can't see that how it relates to Alzheimer's. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, all right, all right. So you've convinced me that, that I mean, without looking at the peer-reviewed published studies and without re seeing the correlation for each of these things, I assume you've, you've, you've done that, you have a paper on it, mm. um, it's, it may be that there's this matrix of things that are all glyphosate-related. Mm -hmm. It would be very interesting to see if we took glyphosate out of the diet, right. would there be a change in mental acuity for the patients suffering from so. these? I think so. First thing I would do if I had Alz if I were diagnosed with Alzheimer's, I mean, I would already do it, but I would get rid of everything <laughs> related to glyphosate. Yeah. Now, there's a whole other story mm -hmm. which has to do with um, tryptophan. 
And so tryptophan is one of those amino acids that gets clobbered by glyphosate. Mm -hmm. So it's already deficient in your food because the food's been exposed to glyphosate. And then the gut bacteria would be producing tryptophan for you, but they can't do it because they've got glyphosate contamination. And so you have a tryptophan deficiency. And then worse than that, you end up with all these uh, toxic gut bacteria, the pathogens. And so you, your body launches an immune re reaction to them. You send in the macrophages to... Uh, to kill those bacteria. And those macrophages are going to be using dangerous arsenal, so they need to have protection against that. And the protection that they get is actually from tryptophan. They produce something called kynurenine from the tryptophan, and they hoard it. So they gather up all this kynurenine in order to be able to protect themselves from the weapons that they're releasing to kill the bacteria. So, so the tryptonite is that's the small amount that's there is getting sucked up by the by the gut by the macrophages. So by the time you get to the blood, there's very little tryptophan left, and um, tryptophan is the sole precursor to serotonin, and serotonin is a known appetite suppressant. So, you have low tryptophan, low serotonin, high appetite. All right. So, let me see if I got this right, and I think this is amazing information. Um, tryptophan is not produced, it's, it's either the synthesis is interfered with, um, and it's not available to protect the cells of the immune system. Immune systems will grab it, because they're, they're in there in the gut uh, fighting the bacteria, and they will suck the tryptophan They need the tryptophan in order to protect their own survival. Yeah, so their they're DNA. hogging it, and they're hogging it, and so the blood gets very little. And when the blood gets very little, then... It's the only way we can get serotonin. Now, I have heard of serotonin. Most yes. people have heard of serotonin, and serotonin is involved with a lot of things. It is. Not just This is appetite. why it branches to other things. Yes, so let's talk about, okay, so we have a problem with serotonin because we're not getting the tryptophan because of the glyphosates getting in the way of the production and whatnot. So now, the first thing we talk about for serotonin is that without a lot of serotonin, we don't have suppression of appetite. So normally serotonin kicks in at a time when you're supposed to stop eating. So like it'll, it'll swell when it's like, okay, I've had two hamburgers, now I'm done. Mm. Or maybe one hamburger. <laughs> and, so, and so without that, the body just keeps eating. Mm. So when they've taken serotonin out of rats' brains, mm -hmm. do they just keep eating? <laughs> I don't know of those experiments, right, but, I'll, we'll but they certainly have associated ser low serotonin with obesity. And interestingly, okay. even when those people went on a diet and lost weight, they still had the serotonin. It didn't fix the problem. So the problem is actually not a consequence of being obese. I mean, they were disciplined and they lost weight, mm -hmm. but it didn't solve their low serotonin problem. Mm -hmm. Because that comes from the glyphosate, I presume, you know? Right. All right, so now you've knocked serotonin out of the park. It's, it's there in feeble quantities, what else does serotonin do? <laughs> very good question. <laughs> well, one thing that I find very fascinating is that serotonin, low serotonin, is very definitely correlated with violent behavior. And I believe that it makes glyphosate may be a contributor to all the, uh, uh, this epidemic that we have in school shootings and the thing that just happened in Boston, you know, that people have such low serotonin that they become irrationally violent and, they, and they're not able to reason you know, about what is the consequences of what I'm doing. And they perform these crazy acts that it seem like, how could anyone do this? And I think it could very well be traced back to the low serotonin that could be caused by the glyphosate. Now, Dr. Sin, if you and I were just giving a presentation together at MIT, and I asked the audience uh, how many people have gotten rid of GMOs, and someone, you know, a lot of people raised their hand, and I said, okay, have you noticed any improvements in health? And a woman said her son was having serious problems. They, they wanted to call him retarded. They wanted him to take, take him out of school. He had all sorts of health problems that were recurring, and he was very aggressive. He had, yeah, he had behavior problems. He was very aggressive. She switched to, she saw the film Genetic Roulette, The Gamble of Our Lives, which is my film, and it talks about some of these things, not in such great detail. Thank you for this amazing discussion. <laughs> and she said, within a week, his life changed, and within a month, he was a different boy. And they can't, it's hardly recognizable now. And the only change was switching to a completely organic diet to, in order to avoid the GMOs and I guess also the glyphosate, and the whole aggressive behavior disappeared. Now we have animal studies showing, and animal livestock, well, very few studies, there's a couple of them, showing more aggressives, uh, aggressive behavior in rodents. But we have livestock experience with cannibalism and, and irritability and, and aggression. 
as reported by veterinarians and farmers mm. when they're eating the Roundup Ready crops. I didn't know that. And that that was completely reversed when they wow. switched to non-GMO crops. Wow. And I have been talking to people. Uh, they talk about some of the other brain things, anxiety, depression. Yes. Um, All of those are associated with serotonin are they? deficiency. Anxiety yes. and depression. Yes. Um, and doesn't tryptophan, when you used to take tryptophan, you, you take it in order to calm the system and yes, all that? Yes. Is that in order to produce serotonin? Yes. So that means all this calmness that we're seeking as a society is just being taken away and we end up having all and these... And when depressed people uh, t have a low, low serotonin in their diet, they get depressed. I mean, people who have problems with depression, low serotonin will bring it on. I see. So low, th in the, low tryptophan in the diet will bring it on. Okay. So then I think that um, this may explain why, you know, you can't... People, like, so interesting, you'll enjoy this. So many farmers and veterinarians use one word consistently to describe their animals after they switch to a non-GMO diet. And they use the same one. They haven't heard anyone else say it. Happier. Happier. <laughs> <laughs> they say the animals word. are happier. And it's like, it's very unscientific. Oh, it's just anecdotal evidence. It's just someone who in relationship to their animal, and who knows about their animals. Yeah. Pet owners know about their animals. Yeah. yeah. The animal's happier, you can tell. You know, even the pigs, you can tell. And these guys just go, they're happier, they're so excited. And um, we, we started you know, asking people about the danger, you know, what's happening with their bodies and their, I was just asking about their health problems, but so many people talked about the mental conditions. Yes. And I went to one doctor's office, she's had 5,000 people taken off of GMOs. She even describes three to five days, there's a change in the mental problems. Wow, that's great. Three to five, I mean, three to seven days, if I remember correctly. And because it's, she happens over and over and over again, so she sees it and it's predictable. And maybe it's the tryptophan yes. link, I the think serotonin so. link. I think that would explain it. All right. Tyrosine is the precursor to dopamine, and tyrosine is also an aromatic amino acid. All right, talk about dopamine because I know I've heard Parkinson's and dopamine move together. Yeah, so dopamine is absolutely the problem with Parkinson's. They, they're uh, um, inferior, and I just I forget the name of this place in their brain that makes this dopamine dopamine product, and the uh, it's it's impaired, and it, it, there isn't enough dopamine uh, being made. Uh, being provided in the brain, so it's a dopamine deficiency problem, and so a dopamine deficiency problem can de can be traced directly back to a tyrosine deficiency problem because that's the precursor. And tyrosine dopamine. is an amino acid. It's an aromatic amino acid, and it's disrupted by. Oh, uh, the aromatics! Those are the ones that are stopped by glyphosate. glyphosate. Yes, and they're normally produced by the gut bacteria. Yes, they're produced by the gut bacteria, and then of course they're also in the food. But of course, if the food's been exposed to glyphosate, then it's going to be right. depleted so, as so well. All right. So, so so the glyphosate eliminates the production both in the gut bacteria of these essential amino acids in the aromatic, uh, in the aromatic section, mm -hmm. and then also in the food itself, it may be bound up and, and unavailable. Mm -hmm. All right. So mm -hmm. the the tyrosine relates to the dopamine. Okay, that's pretty simple. Any other things about that? Yeah, well, in fact, there was, so there has been a study on earthworms, actually, that showed that uh, given earthworms exposed to glyphosate produced a neurological disorder that resembled, um, they, somehow they could tell it was something similar to Parkinson's disease, some kind of neurological yeah, you know, degradation that yeah. related Give to your hand, Paul. Parkinson's. Listen, that was I, the I, only evidence I could find that sort of connected it in that way. From all right, the research I, I hope I'm not being disrespectful, but I, I mean... <laughs> earthworms are people. <laughs> Maybe I'm being disrespectful, but I don't mean to. So. But, um... So that's amazing. Now, I've heard that glyphosate is related to Parkinson's. I mean, when I go... Oh, yes, that's true, because, in fact, uh, people, certainly Parkinsonian people, are told to avoid um, environmental toxins, organophosphates, and, and um, organophosphates, I think, are hooked to Parkinson's, other right. organophosphates. Because I had, you know, um, in my books, I described the list of the, of the specific diseases that are associated with Roundup or glyphosate, and Parkinson's is always there. Yeah. So I uh, now that we understand. More. Now this might be the that might be another paper. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So we'll be done with Parkinson's. Yep. Let's move on. All right. So Parkinson's people get off of, of <laughs> get on organic. <laughs> let's talk about cancer. Yeah. Well, so this this study that you showed in your slides this morning. Oh. oh, that one really. I mean, that came along right at the right time for me to say this has got to be something. Yeah, I read I that in your study. You kept quoting the Seralini. Like, uh, I was very... really, really impressed with that study. Yeah. And this was, and, and in fact, most of the, I mean, all the studies that, that Monsanto has done on glyphosate, first of all, they use, uh, they don't use Roundup, they use glyphosate. Well, I don't know that this is true, but there's a suspicion. 
glyphosate by itself um, is not nearly as toxic as glyphosate in Roundup because Roundup has these adjuvants that are added to it that allow the glyphosate to actually get into the cell. So, uh, so, so in other words, can, if you put glyphosate on your skin, or let's say on a plant, because that's how they start out, a lot of it will just stay on the surface and get washed off. But there's some things that are added in order to make it penetrate. Yes. And uh, this, this turns out to drive it not only into the plant cells, but ta-da, mm -hmm. into human cells. And so when we eat it, it's there as this matrix of chemicals, and so it's just, okay, we're going to smuggle the bad guy in, and then he's going to steal, steal the gem. So mm -hmm. it's like this is the part of you, the part of the chemical that gets in deep into the cells and causes the problems. All right. And so Roundup is much more dangerous, according to so many studies, in terms of birth defects, which we haven't yes. discussed much, uh, in terms of um, reproductive disorders, in terms of just uh, cytotemic, uh, toxicity of the cells, human placental cells, for example. So, um, and Monsanto, we have caught them red-handed. You can see the book <clears throat> Genetic Roulette, the documented health risks of genetically engineered foods. Go to part three, which is how the industry rigs its research. We've caught them red-handed. Oh, wow. They have tobacco science. It's just complete. It's like these guys have bad science down to a science. All right, so talk to me then about... Yeah, about so the Seralini study, so he, so because he, they always did short-term studies, and it takes time for these th problems to develop. And so Seralini gave these rats uh, glyphosate Roundup mm -hmm. uh, for their entire life. And, um, and then he showed that the rats that were fed, and you talked about that, um, all the different versions of the either GMO or glyphosate oh, yeah. or combination. So they, so, they, so they fed Roundup ready... I mean, the backstory is they actually... Um, Seralini obtained the raw data from Monsanto's studies. He's a French researcher that studies a toxicological research uh, into pesticides and things. And he's on the committee that would approve or not or recommend approval for GMOs. And so he was aware that there was really serious problems. And he was able to obtain the raw feeding study mm -hmm. data of the three main genetically modified corn products produced from Monsanto. And every one of them showed signs of toxicity they were completely denied and dismissed and covered up in Monsanto studies. Mm. So he secretly took the one that was causing the most signs of toxicity, which was Roundup Ready corn, mm. corn engineered not to die when sprayed with Roundup, so it sucks up the Roundup for, as a gift for you and me if we eat the corn, and started to feed it to animals for two years, not just for 90 days, because that's what the biotech industry does. And during the first 90 days... No problem. The next month, they started developing tumors, which be, would be completely missed by the framework that is limited by... And they may have even determined that framework. Yeah, yeah, it's like, well, we started getting tumors, so I think we'll cut this thing. <laughs> I yeah. know. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, yeah. We've heard some things, yes. <laughs> yeah, and so, um, and so, yeah, he found... So the, the, the females all developed these huge memory tumors, and the males had problems with their kidneys and their um, and It wasn't their all, by the way. It was up to 80%. Yeah, yeah right. And it was almost all the mammary glands for the, for the yeah, females. Yeah, which is really interesting because we have a huge problem with breast cancer in this country. You know, I think one in five women will be diagnosed with breast, breast cancer before she dies. And I don't know if that's connected because I didn't uh, find the direct connection. But it's just uh -huh. an interesting fact that this is showing up in the, in the rats and in the humans. And you kind of could guess that it might. But I don't have the... I don't have the story yet for that. Is there one. any other link to... And then there's also other kinds of cancers, and I talked about this one in the paper. There's this one cancer that people who work with glyphosate get that has to do with the blood, and that one, I think, causes 2% of the cancer deaths, so it's not as insignificant cancer. Wow. Um, you know, and, 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 um, so when you see people work with the glyphosate, you mean farm workers? Yeah, yeah. People who so, um, so glyphosate, I think... Uh, the cancer part of the paper is weak. I, we didn't do a lot of studying there, so we may pick up on that later if we okay. find more evidence. But right. there, um, but I think, that, and you could expect there would be a can, uh, connection because it produces these toxic phenols, which cause cancer. So. Oh yeah, we talked about the toxic phenols. What's a phenol? So a phenol is a five carbon. It, it's a, a molecule that contains a five carbon ring, and then it has a, um, oxygen attached to it, and there's various forms of it. Picresol is one, is an example, and these these are the things that are produced as a digression from the aromatic amino acids because that pathway isn't working, so they show up in the gut. Oh, they, oh, so because the aromatic amino acids are not being created... They create this instead. They said, okay, let's just create this. We're, we're making something, let's, let's create this. And so they yeah. create this and it's toxic. Yeah, it's toxic. But it actually has an interesting advantage, the toxic phenols, we think, and we wrote about this in our paper. This is our theory, so mm -hmm. I have, you won't read it anywhere else. They can become sulfated. And they have around, and they have a carbon ring, just like 
cholesterol does. So we suspect that the phenol is able to transport the sulfate safely through the hepatic portal vein. Oh, so it is, it's like the pinch hitter. It's like we can't get the, the tryptophan and others to work, or, or in this case, the sulfur. The sulfor, it has a problem sulfur with work, transport, right. but if we hook it up with the phenol, then it won't gel oh. the blood. And therefore, so, we can ship it to the liver. So it's not the tryptophan, it's the sulfur. Okay, so it means that we can't produce enough sulfur to transport the stuff through the... We can't, produce, we can't send the sulfate can't, by itself because it will gel the blood. We right. have to buddy it up, just like we buddy it up with cholesterol. We, with we the have to buddy it up with phenol. And then the phenol can carry it to the liver, and then it gives the sulfate to the liver. And this is known that it does this. And then the phenol becomes toxic once it gets rid of the sulfate. So they, they, again, just like the cholesterol, they hold hands, they're wonderful. As soon as they let go, the phenol is, is a problem. And so it can uh, cause damage to the liver. And that might be liver, liver cancer? Yeah, liver cancer, cirrhosis. I mean, all these kinds of liver problems, inflammation in the liver, all those things could be traced back to the exposure to the phenols in order to be able to get the sulfate which is desperately needed, so you don't, you know, it's kind of like, what game do you want to play? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about multiple sclerosis. Yes, well, so in multiple sclerosis is involved with an inflammation of the, um, of the um, myelin, you know, in the, in the nervous system, in the brain. And, um, the myelin is what? The myelin is this myelin sheath that myelin um, sheath. covers the um, axons. Mm -hmm. and I mean, it's, there's a lot of it in the brain, but it's a uh, substance that uh, you say provides axons. You're talking about the nerve, the, the the nerve cells. Yeah. So there's these connections the between the nervous nerve system cells. Has little little padding, like insulation almost. It looks yes, like insulation. insulation surrounding where the, where the signal. So when the signal's sent through a long wire, it needs insulation in order to stay inside the wire. Otherwise, the signal will leak out. Okay. And the myelin provides that insulation. And, um, and myelin has a lot of cholesterol in it, and it also has a lot of, a lot of sulfur. So it's no, a no-brainer to think that without cholesterol and without adequate sulfate, you would have trouble producing myelin. And it's also tied to the cobalamin. Uh, and I just found out recently from someone I've been talking to from Manitoba, Canada, since I wrote my paper, um, and he's, it triggered us to be interested in this new paper on cobalamin because um, He's talking about uh, something he's been seeing in, in uh, swine over the last six years mm -hmm. as a veterinarian. He's a veterinarian in Canada, and he's been seeing this paralysis, uh, hind limb paralysis. Have you heard about this? Hind limb paralysis. So in the pigs the are getting are having trouble walking. Yes, um, that's due to inflammation in the spinal cord. Um, oh, you talked about inflammation in the spinal cord before. I forget what it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I just, yeah. I found out about this, the, and this is really yeah. kind of lighting me up because I really think I need to look into this, and, I, and it's, tied, it's tied directly to cobalamin. They, and I found articles that talk about swine getting paralysis through cobalamin deficiency. And cobalamin deficiency cobalt. is the lack of cobalt. Yes. All right, so... So I think that could tie to that. And then the third thing with the uh, multiple sclerosis is, in fact, the gut bacteria. And they have found that, like, there's an allergic reaction. You get a sort of autoimmune reaction because you're exposed to something from the gut bacteria that looks a lot like something in your, in your own cells. So you, get, so you start attacking yourself. It's a sort of it's an autoimmune deficiency disease. And you attack your myelin sheath because it looks like something that's in these gut bacteria that leaked out because of the leaky gut. So you have that connection as now, well. Now, leaky gut, how, would you, how do you link glyphosate with leaky gut? Is it just because it's, it's causing messed up gut bacteria and the bacteria itself then cause Well, it, I think it's actually because it causes the, so I think it's the sulfate deficiency that's causing the leaks because when the cell is deficient in sulfate, it, it shrinks and that provides holes between it and that allows the bacteria to escape. This is very interesting because I was look. I'm trying to get this because people talk about the junction points between mm. cells uh, are very tight. The tight junctions. And then they become called. looser for leaky gut. Yes. Now, I've been linking leaky gut with the possibility of BT toxin, which is another aspect. Which of I think levels. you may be right on that. But that pokes holes in the cells themselves. It might also poke holes in the junctions, but it pokes yeah. holes in the cells. Wow. We did, they never check the, the, the membranes. Yeah. But if it, if it, I mean, the, the, the junctions, amazing. but it may cause leakage within the cells. But I was wondering about this yeah, junction. Yeah, the between. leaky gut has to do with the cells shrinking and um, and therefore allowing gaps between them because they're supposed to be a tight, you know, as you say, tight junctions between all the cells that all are right. lining the epithelium of the gut, 
And so when they shrink up, then they allow the bacteria to escape. That could be even more powerful than the Bt toxin. Yeah. In any case, it allows like unfettered access to the bloodstream right. by the glyphosate in the body as well as everything That's else. That's right. The glyphosate can get out and of course the bacteria can get out and the bacteria then have all these products that are that are now your immune system is exposed to all these things that it's not supposed to be exposed to and that's how you can get a accidental match to something in the myelin that then it causes you to attack the myelin because you think it's foreign. This connection between um, leaky gut and glyphosate is huge. I mean there are tens of thousands of practitioners right. now that believe leaky gut is the source of so many diseases. It's not fully accepted by the American Medical Association right. model, um, but it's still being used as a working model, and it's, people are saying that they're actually having tremendous uh, successes by healing the leaky gut, and then the diseases associated with it yes. um, find success. So what about inflammatory bowel disease? And you have it in the paper as listed with anorexia nervosa. And then later you have something called cachexia, yeah. which is muscle wasting, but you say they're all related. They're all, I think they're all related, and I think they're, um, they're all tied to this uh, whole inflammatory gut problem that is caused by the glyphosate because these pathogenic bacteria are releasing all kinds of things, not just the toxic phenols that I mentioned, but also something called the lipopolysaccharide, LPS, which is something, which is a toxin. And, um, and then as I mentioned, the ammonia and the... Uh, and the uh, <laughs> Uh, formaldehyde, so, and so the, the gut's in trouble, and so you're bringing in these macrophages, and you've got all this inflammation going on, and that's going to damage the gut, and then you're going to get all these more leaks, and then so stuff is going to get out into the blood that's, you know, going to cause lots of problems, and um, certainly inflammatory bowel disease. Um, colitis and Crohn's disease are both associated with sulfate deficiency in the matrix proteins. So now we have are, colitis and Crohn's. Yeah, and those are both, um, you know... Uh, and irritable bowel, too? Well, that's, yeah, I suspect so. I don't have a paper on that specifically, but I, I would imagine, because it's a similar problem, that the, that the gut lining doesn't have enough sulfate, and then it, it's problematic for its health. So mm -hmm. um, sulfate is needed everywhere to protect everything. So whenever sulfate's deficient, you're going to have trouble. So I think in a sense that I'm suspecting that your genetics dictates which of your organs are going to have trouble. So if you have a genetic predisposition towards Alzheimer's, then you'll raid the brain for the sulfate, basically. Or if you have a genetic predisposition towards kidney failure, then you'll raid the kidney. So you're basically trying to let somebody sacrifice for the sake of everybody else, you know, and because you desperately need the sulfate in the blood or else the blood won't, won't uh, work properly. Okay. Yeah. All right, so um, this is amazing. Um, and then the anorexia. Yeah, I mean, so I think, in fact, um, the end stage of Alzheimer's, for example, or like AIDS, all of these diseases that when you get really sick, you end up with cachexia, muscle, your muscles basically start wasting away. Um, they're not able to work properly because they've lost cholesterol and sulfate. They have the same problem that the brain would have if it uh -oh. lost cholesterol and sulfate, no energy and then um, no ability to get the sugar in, so they can't get the fuel, so they're basically really crippled. I mean, they're, you know, they're really in trouble. So the brain, so the muscle wasting is the physical system's version of what you describe as the mechanics happening in Alzheimer's, yeah. where there's no energy for the, and no, no information transport. Yeah, so I think, you know, you either can get really weak muscles or you can get a sick brain, because those two or, uh, types of cells require a lot of energy, so they're gonna be the first ones to get hit, mm -hmm. the muscles in the brain. And the nervous system, and um, and so the and then you get to a point I think where you can't eat, and this happens in anorexia nervosa when people get really really thin. I mean they're trying so hard to stay thin, and their model they really need to be thin, and they're therefore facing all this inflammation, which actually would have been much better if they'd gotten fat. They would have been able to. The fat would have really helped to solve that problem. For example, mm -hmm. the sulfate transport, mm -hmm. and I think also the fat can kind of um, protect you. It can it can take in some of these toxins and keep it there and therefore protect you from them. You know, so fat right. actually becomes protected. When you, when you lose weight, you actually release those toxins and you get sick. Um, but the anorexic person eventually reaches a point where their blood can no longer transport food. This is what I think. And you get into this situation where people are in the hospital and you have to be very tricky with the refeeding program because you can kill them. You can kill them with food because their blood is so sick that it can't afford to get the food from the gut to the places where it needs to go, and that they become unable to eat, you know. So it, they become, you know, you get into a situation where they're starving, and you almost can't solve the problem. So I want to share with you some anecdotal evidence 
uh, around what we've talked about. Um, I talked to one person at a doctor's office and she had uh, taken GMOs out of her diet and within three days her Crohn's disease of 30 years disappeared. Mm. I talked to people who, another person at a doctor's office, it took six to eight weeks for her irritable bowel to disappear and another one about three weeks. Um, many, many people over and over again talk about gut problems, pain in the gut, mm. um, even acid, into acid reflux, but also all sorts of gut inflammation, ulcers, things like that, the whole gut health. And they even when you look at the uh, pig stomachs taken at a slaughterhouse, comparing the pigs that were fed GM versus non-GM, those that were fed GM have ulcers and inflammation mm. compared to the healthy normal wow. ones for those eating non-GM. Um, and we didn't know why, and this could explain it. Um, the the um, butchers, when they butcher these, these animals, uh, they see a difference between the animals that were fed GM and non-GM. First of all, they say the GM fed animals stink. Horrible mm. stench. And they think it may be the gut bacteria wow. transformed into the, into the negative stuff. They see a discoloration yellowing ah. instead of white. I've seen the pictures. We show them on our, on our PowerPoint. And also, when they pull the intestines, they're sometimes paper thin, oh, wow. and they just tear <gasps> apart. So they say they can't use intestines in the U.S. for sausage casings. They have to wow. go to New Zealand, where they don't use GM. That's uh, fascinating. Yeah. I did and not know so it's know like this. this is like real-world stuff. Um, and wow. one veterinarian told me... <clears throat> He sees differences in the autopsies of animals fed GM versus non-GM. He, he looked into a liver, and he said the liver looked like a bomb went off in it. Mm. I've been wondering whether they don't sell liver anymore because it looks so gross that nobody would buy it. Oh, really? Know? I'm wondering that because, I mean, liver's never, it, not really on the menu anymore. The grocery store, it's hard to find, right? I didn't know. And I'm wondering if that's because it looks so horrible that nobody would buy it, you know? I'm just wondering. I don't know. <laughs> but All you right. would imagine that because the liver is certainly getting hit hard by this problem. Now, in this discussion, we've discussed a lot of diseases, but I think there's a whole group that feels left out. Those with diabetes and heart disease, because they're related. Yes. So you mentioned them in the paper. Yes. Talk about that. Okay, that's a huge topic. Right. <laughs> we'll see how far I can get with it. I do have another paper, actually, that talks about di uh, diabetes and heart disease. And uh, we particularly focused on this uh, molecule called ENOS, endothelial nitric oxide synthase. Which Just ENOS for me, thank you. <laughs> ENOS, yes, we won't say that again. <laughs> and ENOS is a really, really interesting molecule. And one of the things that we identified is that ENOS produces, we believe, ENOS produces sulfate. We have this paper and we discuss how this is feasible. ENOS resembles uh, enzymes found in bacteria that produce sulfate. In the same, it has the mechanism to do it, and those bacteria depend on sunlight. So we think ENOS makes sulfate in the skin in exposure to sunlight. So part of the issue is lack of sunlight exposure um, as contributing, and it's known that sunlight, um, sunny places have less heart disease, mm -hmm. so it's um, connected to heart disease. Um, ENOS makes a sulfate, the sulfate connects to the cholesterol. The skin also provides a great deal of cholesterol. The skin cells produce cholesterol, and that cholesterol then gets combined with, so this is well known, gets combined with sulfate to produce cholesterol sulfate, and the skin is probably the biggest producer of cholesterol sulfate for the body. And so with this sunlight, allowing it to make the sulfate. So the cholesterol sulfate then is distributed, as I said, and provides cholesterol and sulfate to all the tissues. So when, so ENOS is a CYP enzyme. CYP. Yes. The cytochrome P450 metabolic pathway that is interrupted because glyphosate comes along and says, uh, uh you ain't working anymore. That's right. That so one. I suspect that glyphosate may be messing up ENOS's ability to make sulfate, which then impairs the release of sulf cholesterol sulfate from the skin, which then causes cholesterol and sulfate deficiency throughout the body, which I think is the underlying cause of all the diseases. So you're saying cholesterol deficiency. Most cholesterol people think that deficiency, cholesterol, that's right. Some people say that, well, a lot of people say that there's too much cholesterol. That's right. And there's too much cholesterol in those packaged up things, LDL and HDL, because there isn't enough of the cholesterol sulfate. The sulfated cholesterol can travel freely in the blood, but you don't have that, so you have to have more of the other ones, and that's why it's elevated. More than that, the cholesterol piles up in the arteries that are feeding the heart. Now, one thing I find interesting that nobody seems to ask is why is it that heart disease occurs in the heart? If I were smart, like biology is, and I had some crud that I needed to get rid of, I needed to park it somewhere, the last place I would put it in the is in the arteries leading to the heart. 
that's like the wrong place to put it. If I'm going to block some arteries. It's like your children's tricycle. Yeah, just put it in the front, the front door, you know, just right in front. In fact, put it just below the steps so as people are leaving. So, yeah, the body's a little more intelligent than that. Yeah, so, so the fact on? that that plaque is piling up exactly in the place that provides uh, blood supply to the most critical organ in the body makes you think that that plaque might be providing something to that organ. And what I think it is providing is cholesterol sulfate. And the cholesterol sulfate um, being, why is the heart? Why does the heart need cholesterol the, sulfate? The heart, heart tremendously needs both of those, uh, cholesterol and sulfate. First of all, it's a muscle, so it, of course it uses a huge amount of energy. And the cholesterol, as you recall, will protect from ion leaks, and ion leaks will exhaust the cell because it has to keep using up all of its energy to pack the ions on the other side. So the cholesterol in the membrane is really important for that. Um, and then the uh, uh, li lipid rafts, which are these places that have high, high concentrations of cholesterol, are absolutely essential for the contraction of the muscle that's going to cause the heart to beat. So if you don't have enough lipid rafts, then you're going to have deficiencies in um, uh, contracting. And also when p potassium starts leaking out of the cell because of the lack of cholesterol, then it starts to substitute calcium because calcium is a bigger molecule. And the cell gets too much calcium in the cytoplasm, but it needs the calcium to be in these internal store places in order to be able to contract. So that weakens its ability to contract as well. And then the, and then the sulfate is what's going to allow it to clean up garbage. So it has these proteins that are, that are broken that need to be uh, recycled. And it needs the sulfate in order to be able to do that. So it ends up getting piled up with crud that it can't get rid of. And the cell again becomes dis uh, disabled because of that. So there's all kinds of different ways in which the cells are getting messed up. Also, we believe, and this is something we're working on, that the sulfate plays a critical role in the electrical si system that communicates, that allows the heart to actually beat in an organized fashion. So you get into this kind of arrhythmias because of the insufficient sulfate. We haven't proved this yet, but we're working on that on that idea. You just covered almost everything that a cell needs to do. It has <laughs> energy, and it's, a, and it's a cleanup, and it's got electrical impulses, and they're all needing. Disrupted by the inadequate cholesterol sulfate. And the really interesting thing is that Elevated homocysteine is a very good risk factor for heart disease. Homocysteine is a sulfur-containing molecule that can become sulfate. I think I talked about that earlier. Homocysteine becomes yeah. uh, converted to sulfate in the presence of inflammation. It needs the inflammation in order to be able to convert, be converted to sulfate. And so you have inflammation in the artery wall that's a key factor in heart disease. And the homocysteine actually induces inflammation. This is well known, well established. In the, it goes in and it attaches itself to the plaque and it causes the cells to release superoxide. And the superoxide is used to make sulfate from the homocysteine, and the macrophages that are in the plaque are holding on to cholesterol, waiting for the opportunity to let it go as cholesterol sulfate. So it's the sulfur deficiency that's causing the uh -huh. cholesterol to pile up in the artery wall in the plaque. And then the homocysteine comes in to use it to create the... The, the homocysteine uses the inflammation, inflammation to make the sulfate, and then the sulfate gets combined to the cholesterol. So instead of enos making sulfate, because enos is broken, it is made this other way that involves inflammation in the artery wall. And that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. So the inflammation damages the artery wall, and you get into all the different problems. Of course, you get the blockage because the cholesterol is all piled up in there. And the cholesterol needs fat in order to be able to be stored. Cholesterol has to be stored with fat, or it, they, they go together. So you've got this fat and cholesterol in the artery wall waiting for an opportunity to be delivered as cholesterol sulfate once there's some uh, homocysteine and some sulfur and some superoxide. So there's like all this stuff waiting to happen that's causing this buildup. And the reason is because the heart is desperate for cholesterol and sulfate. It's the opposite of what they're saying. I mean, I do not understand how they can demonize cholesterol the way they do, because if you look, everyone who knows anything about cholesterol as a researcher knows that it's absolutely essential in so many ways to the body. There's very little about cholesterol that's bad. And but yet they've made it out to be a demon. But the higher levels of low cholesterol may indicate health problems. Low cholesterol is actually a much more serious I mean, I mean, problem higher, than high cholesterol. Higher, higher levels of the bad right, cholesterol. Right, right. The high LDL indicates problems, but the problems have to do with cholesterol sulfate deficiency. Oh, okay. That's what's causing the LDL to be high. All right. So you need the cholesterol sulfate, and so that's it. So plaque is trying to help out the heart because that organ desperately needs the cholesterol sulfate, and that's why the plaque builds up in the heart. That's a totally different view it is. Of plaque and totally different view of cholesterol yes. than you'd get from your doctor. It, it's pretty much, yes. Pretty, pretty, much, much, pretty much opposite. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's right. So let's now talk about America's favorite um, disorder, 
Obesity. What is it? Obesity. That's right. You guessed it. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay, you win the point. Very okay, let, interesting. So talk about obesity. And I was really excited when we started to connect the dots on that because that, that was something I was proud of in the paper. That, because um, it's like everyone says, yeah, it's just calories, but is it really just calories? What not is? at all. Uh -huh. Not at all. And in fact, it, it in part has to do with the micronutrient deficiency because mm -hmm. when your body doesn't have enough micronutrients, you keep on having to eat more and more of all the macronutrients, which is all the calories, in order to get enough micronutrients into your body. So that right there. This makes complete sense. Let me go over this, what you just said, okay? So you're eating one pound of food. Mm. And in that pound of food, there should be cobalt, yes. manganese, yes. Um, zinc, mm -hmm. all the things that are now grabbed by glyphosate and completely unavailable or partially unavailable. So you eat all that and your body goes, hmm, so where's the zinc? Where's the cobalt? I have this work to do when we need cobalt. We've got to produce vitamin B12. The manganese is needed for, for an allergy reaction. It's needed for reproductive health. So we need to eat more in order to get the little amount. So now you have to eat another pound, but maybe it's reduced much more than by half. Maybe it's reduced by one-tenth. So now you have to eat 10 pounds <laughs> of food in order to get the needed amount of cobalt to do the work that your body is desperate to be doing, otherwise you get sick. Right, that's right. So you have a choice, either get fat or get sick, you know? And so, that's kind of what happens, I think, because the people who resist getting obese get sick. Uh, many of them, I think, have issues with the di digestive tract and the wow. depression and all these things. So the body actually increases hunger because mm -hmm. it's hungry for these things. So we have bigger portions. It's like yeah. the supersize me of America. And that could be because of the mineral depletion in the food that we eat. And that's done, of course, through the chelation of glyphosate. Yeah. Uh, and the diabetes is quite similar. Um, and this is, gets back to the sulfate uh, being needed um, to store the sugar outside the cell in these extra oh, yeah, right, cellular right. matrix. So uh, I think it's actually really cool that the cells... Um, so yeah, so th now we're getting into diabetes. Okay, so let's just pick this piece up. Okay. Without the sulfate or the sulfur, yeah. then... The storing of the glucose yes. outside the cell is impaired. That's right. And you can't and, and that's where the storehouse of energy is, the sugar. Yes. All right? Now, so you you have you're taking glyphosate laden foods, all of a sudden your cells can't store the sugar. Now what? Yeah, so the sugar builds up in the blood. Why would it build up in blood? Because there's no else to store. Yeah, so basically what, what's supposed to happen, as I see it, is that you eat a meal, the sugar, of course, also we're eating this food that goes in really fast, so the sugar comes pouring into the blood mm -hmm. way too much, and the, the body's really struggling to get rid of it because sugar in the blood is really dangerous, you know, that's what causes all this glycation damage, which is why diabetes is bad. And so you need to get that sugar out, and the cells can take the sugar out and process some of it and make energy, but and take some it. of it and throw it outside the door. It's sort of like storing, you know, your milk in the refrigerator. I mean, it's basically just pour the or sugar actually, outside the door. actually, some people have a little compost thing or, or trash or, or a pantry outside the house. So it's outside, this, outside the cell. Yeah. They store it there for later, and they use that storage capacity to drain the blood. Yes. They, can, they can grab more than they can use and put some of it outside the cell and let it sit there. And then once they've used up what's available, they can go bring it back in. And this stuff recycles like every three or four hours, so it's perfect. Sort of like when you get towards the middle of the time afternoon between the two meals, you can kick this in and you can grab that sugar that you've stored outside and use it for energy. But if you uh, can't do that because you don't have enough sulfate, then you're going to have to let the sugar back up in the blood and the cells are going to be in trouble, they won't have enough energy, and all that stuff's going to happen. So. And you have high blood sugar. Yes. And that's diabetes. diabetes. There you have it. <laughs> wow. I'm going to read you the, paragraph, the, the sentence that we started with. Now you have the background to understand that this, the consequences of the interaction of glyphosate with these molecules and these metabolic pathways are most of the diseases and conditions associated with Western, design, Western diet, which include gastrointestinal disorders, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, depression, autism, infertility, cancer, and Alzheimer's. So you may not remember all the mechanisms that we talked about. I certainly won't, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll read the transcript. Um, but the, 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 basically the going home instruction is... To avoid <laughs> do everything you can. And of course, in this country, it's especially hard because we have so much of it everywhere, even in the water supply, probably. I mean, it's in so the water supply, but it's also in the conventional grains because they spray yes. glyphosate 
on conventional oh, grains. Oh, this is right. We didn't talk about that, but that's right. Yeah, yeah. So and just before they're harvested to dry them down. And the glyphosate is stored in the fast-growing uh, tissues, which is that point is the food. So you spray lentils, barley, uh, rice, oats with glyphosate before you harvest, pretty soon before you harvest, I mean, just, just before you harvest, so it gets sucked into the food, and now it's in our food supply that way too. So the, the take-home instruction is avoid GMOs, but also switch to organic, especially in grains, in order to avoid the glyphosate. And stop, in my opinion, using Roundup in a way right. that you can be ex exposed to this. I mean, uh, we have a lot of evidence showing that just spraying it can end up getting into your blood system. And that's probably not a good thing based on what you heard today. Yes. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, you have an amazing mind where you see all these things. I was, you know, all these things are just laid out in this matrix that's just... It's quite a puzzle. <laughs> it's amazing. It's, really it's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, it's going to take me a while. It's going to take us all a while to see you put it together. And thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. It. My pleasure.